In this final video on the Community Ecology series, we're going to be looking at the idea of a trophic structure. And that's what we'll entitle this last flowchart. Trophic structure. And when we see this term, trophic, this word trophic, we always think of this as the idea of eating or as the idea of food. And the trophic structure within a community ecology is the idea of looking at the many feeding relationships that we see within the community. And this, is, this can get quite complex in terms of how these feeding relationships interact with each other, but what we're going to be doing is establishing a basic food chain and a basic food web off of that food chain that we can understand several different ideas behind energy transfer and the idea of trophic levels. So, what we're going to first establish is the fact that energy from food is obtained. That's what the whole purpose of food is, is to get the energy from the food. And in order for us to do that, we have to then take that energy from the food and look at it from a community ecology level. Broaden our scope and look at the fact that when you get energy from food, that energy is subsequently going to be transferred all throughout and upwards through trophic levels. So we're going to go up trophic levels and establish a basic food chain. So the idea of a transfer of energy up these trophic levels will be established through the following food chain. We're going to start with the very basic idea that there are plants. Those plants will be eaten, consumed in this feeding relationship by, of course, herbivores. And herbivores oftentimes will be consumed by carnivores. This is a key idea, something that you probably learned in middle school or even earlier, the idea that plants go to herbivores and herbivores go to carnivores. And then on this side, we also have decomposers. We cannot forget these critical, critical parts of this food chain. Plants are simply going to be considered the autotrophs of our food chain. They make their own food, troph, there's that phrase again, that term. So they self-eating, they make their own food. They're considered primary producers. They are a critical first part of this food chain, and they are the ultimate source of energy that starts everything together because they take energy from the sunlight and convert it into their own useful form, which becomes a plant as a whole. Herbivores are now producers, but they're actually consumers, and they're considered primary consumers that exclusively eat these primary producers, the plants. Carnivores, on the other hand, can be a variety of consumers. They can be secondary consumers, they can also be tertiary or even quaternary consumers, and so forth. So we're going to have uh, a bit more complexity as we move down this food chain. What we establish here, of course, is exactly that. We've established a food chain. This is a link, a system that has energy transferring up trophic levels. Of course I drew this downwards, but the idea is the same, that plants go to herbivores and herbivores go to carnivores. And then on the side we also have decomposers who are going to decompose the dead elements of our community. So we have lots and lots of interactions, just like community ecology has taught us and showed us throughout the previous lectures. We can take this food chain concept and sort of uh, complicate it and add some details to it by stating that there will also be the formation of food webs. These are more complex structures, more complex feeding relationships that work off of this idea of a food chain. This food webs will include food chains that are linked together. And that's the key here. They are linked together. So we have some complexity added to our food chain. A given species, a key idea here, a key point is that you have to remember that a given species, so just one species, may be in a web may be in a web, and we of course are talking about a food web, at more than one trophic level. At more than one trophic level. So we can't think of this trophic level as being just a uh, all or none phenomenon. 
You can move between trophic levels depending on the consumers in the environment, depending on the secondary or tertiary or quaternary or even primary consumers that are within the environment. The environment plays a critical role in this idea of movement of species between trophic levels within more complicated and complex food webs. Finally, we can look at trophic structure and understand it through the idea of limits. And limits are a key part of community ecology because we have to understand that there will be a resistance and there will be specifically limits on the food chain length. Just how far this food chain can go within the community and the ecology that surrounds it. We have to state that all food chains, and this is a fact based off of much uh, quantified research, all food chains are limited in the number of links that they have. So all food chains, limited. And there's that idea of limit, limit. All food chains limited in number of links that it has. Number of links that it has. What we mean by this is that there's going to be this idea of energy, and energy transferring through what we call an energetic hypothesis. This is a powerful concept that ecologists have developed based on the limits that they know exist. Namely, the fact that in the energetic hypothesis, the food chain length is going to be limited by what we call an inefficient uh, transfer of energy. So we'll say that Fc for food chain length limited. We said it was limited, but now why is it limited? That's what ecologists are all about, figuring out why it's limited. Well, food chain lengths are limited by what we consider an inefficiency, inefficiency of energy transfer. And this is just how food chains and food webs work. There's inefficiency. What we mean by this inefficiency is that as you move up a trophic level, only 10%, only about 10% of energy stored in organic matter in organic matter of each trophic level will be transferred to the next level that is a low number. You lose 90%. Only 10% of the potential energy, let's say within one of these organisms, will be transferred to the organism that consumes it. That is a huge loss of energy. A, a way to really understand this is to look at an example. Let's imagine that we have 100 kilograms of plants within in a community. And we have a, an herbivore, a primary consumer. That, those 100 kilograms of plants will support only about 10 kilograms of herbivores because you get a 10% uh, transfer of organic energy, of organic matter. And then those 10 kilograms of herbivores will probably only be able to support 1 kilogram of carnivores. So we see this incredibly inefficient transfer of energy simply because this is how the transfer of energy works on the cellular level overall and thus what we notice is that this energetic hypothesis runs true and states the following final prediction. The energetic hypothesis will say over here predicts food chains should be longer food chains should technically, based off of what we established, be longer in habitats of higher photosynthetic production. This is the importance, we could say, of the plants. If we have lots of photosynthesis, higher photosynthetic production, we expect longer food chains, more complex food webs, because there's more possible energy to work off of, and thus this chain can continue 
over and over and more so in much greater depth. If we started with a thousand kilograms of plants, our numbers drastically change in terms of this 10% inefficient transfer of energy up the trophic levels that we've established. So these are our limits. Our limits are contained through this energetic hypothesis that we established, and the end-all be-all is that longer food chains will be present if you have lots of photosynthetic production, lots of autotrophs, lots of plants. And finally, uh, the last idea to understand about trophic, truffer, uh, trophic structure is that species uh, are going to, some species will have a large impact. Species with large impact on community. And it's not what you actually would intuitively think. It's a little bit weird thinking about which species would have the largest impact. There are two main types of species in a trophic structure. Those would be the dominant species. And just the name itself makes you think that the dominant species would be the most abundant species, of course, because it is dominant. And it is. It's the most abundant Yet even though it's the most abundant, it has the highest biomass, it is actually not going to have, it has no critical effect. It has no critical effect, and this is very weird to think because it's dominant, though it still does not have a critical effect on the community structure. And that doesn't really make sense at first, but when you look at the other side of the story, when you look at what we call a keystone species, this is what will have an effect, a major effect. A keystone species will be the following. These species are usually not abundant, so usually not abundant. And though they're not abundant, they actually will play some sort of critical ecological role. Who knows what it is, but they do have a critical ecological role. And what happens is if we remove our keystone species, let's say, experimentally remove our KS for keystone, we actually will directly decrease species richness altogether. The amount of species, different species within our community. So remove KS decrease species richness, thus decrease that Shannon uh, diversity index value of H. So what we would imagine is why not the dominant species? Why is this not the largest impact? Well, that's because there's so many of these individuals. And if you remove just one of these individuals, then you're not going to have a big difference. But let's say you remove something that's not as abundant. You remove something rare yet important, thus you will have a major impact on the community as a whole. So overall, we've concluded our discussion on community ecology. Be aware that populations interact with each other through the many mechanisms that we established, the idea of community interactions playing a major role in the way that ecology overall sets itself up. Look how we've established the population ecology, broaden our scope to the community ecology, and now have a great understanding of two important parts of our ecological landscape.